can you animate to educate? Who, 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 who likes art? Does anybody draw? Does anybody doodle? Does anybody use things creatively to get messages across? Some of you do, some of you don't. Okay, so this is what I did. Okay, so, um, so I was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease back in 2016 uh, when I was 41 and I was um, about six months away from finishing my Master's in Medical Education so I was wondering why it was taking me a bit longer than, than normal um, I wondered why when I was writing things down it, it was, my thought processes weren't uh, as usual as, as they were and the first thing I noticed was, was basically when I was typing my assignments, I noticed that my, my, uh, my index finger would just tremor ever so slightly. Uh, and that was the first thing that I noticed, apart from being absolutely, being very, very, very tired. So, so yeah, so, um, so that was back in, in, in 2016, uh, four years later. Um, 
I, I gave this talk last year, and it's really about about drawing. So drawing and creativity, uh, and, uh, and using that to to educate. So the question is, uh, well, what, why why did I start to draw? And um, I always drew uh, as a as a child. Um, when I was growing up, I used to draw, copy things out of books, cartoons, that sort of thing. Um, and um, I, I, I didn't do it at GCSE, didn't do it at, at A level, anything like, like that. It was just really a hobby. And then life sort of got in the way. So I um, went to university in Belfast, um, medical school, got my degree, uh, did my house jobs in Northern Ireland, then came over here in 2004. Um, I was married in 2000, um, and then we uh, we have two children. So Ben is now 14, Anna is 10, and la life just really got busy, and uh, there wasn't really much time to draw anything uh, until about 18 months ago, when I picked up a pencil and a sketch pad and I started to to draw, and I did it mainly at my kids swim three nights a week, so Mondays, Thursdays, and Fridays. So I sit around a swimming pool for two hours, um, sort of twiddling your thumbs and sort of think to yourself, well, what will I do to, to sort of um, fill in the time? Uh, maybe do a bit of CPD. Uh, but I decided that I would start to, to sketch. And um, I, was sitting at, I was sitting at work one day and I thought, um, and it was based on, 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 on something she'd said. So we were really quite open as a family about the diagnosis. So, you know, the ki kids are savvy, aren't they? They know, they know when something's not right. They know when, um, when things just aren't the way they should be. So uh, we told the kids quite quickly. So my daughter was eight. Oh no, she was six when I was diagnosed. And my, my son was 10. And my daughter, um, she didn't really say a lot, um, but she would she would come out with some quotes um, now and again. Usually, um, usually at night time when she was being put to bed and she had her story read, she would just pop her head off the pillow and ask a question. Um, uh, and then one, one day she said, as um, I always wondered sort of what, what the effect was on them and how they were dealing with it, but um, I was, she was going out to Girls Brigade, she goes to Girls Brigade on, on Tuesday night and um, it's always a bit of a, a rush because it's quarter past six and um, you know I get home from work, tea, get changed, come on, let's go, let's go. So she, I was sitting at the bottom of the stairs, having just taken my medication, I, I had a cup of coffee in one hand, I was trying to get my shoe on the other hand, um, I, I, my keys were on the floor and she's like, come on, come on dad, hurry up, hurry up. And I'm like, oh. and then she goes. Then she realised that obviously I didn't like. She, she could see that that would get me a bit stressed. So then she goes, and then she goes, oops, oh, don't, no, don't forget that. Um, th there's no hurry. There's absolutely no hurry. We've got, we've got time. We'll be fine. So whenever, um, whenever um, she said that, I was sitting at work the next day, and I thought, do you know what? I might just sketch out that scene. So I was sitting having lunch at work. And there was a napkin, I bought a needle in the shop as you do in the hospital. And I sitting with a napkin and thought, do you know what, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna sketch what, what that was like. So so I did this in the back of my napkin. So this all goes back to university whenever I actually did do a bit of sketching. And at the end of five years I met my wife day one at the university and, and, and when we graduated I, I, I presented her a little book, a little book of all this of sketches through university. So I was A, she was L, uh, and then in, in that story, um, we're, we're all A. So that, that's sort of where it started. So sometimes a little idea can just ping in the back of a napkin and you see where, see where it goes. So, so how do I draw? So I draw, this time last year, I, I, I would have stood here and said I draw one way, and now I stand here and say I draw two ways. So um, the way I draw is basically uh, quite simple. So I uh, use a pencil, I use a rubber, and I use Faber Castell pens, which are in the ink. So you can get different sizes. So you can get small, uh, medium, you can get bold, and you can get super small. Uh, that's where that's where they come. 
This is the best thing, value for money, okay? You can get three W8 Smith, five, A5, 200 pages, sketch pads, for 9.99, yeah? I, I, I actually think they're even, sometimes on the website you can get them for 6 99 So it's absolutely the best investment I've made. So that's what they are, they're just A5. How do, you, how do you design the picture? So how do you try to portray what you're trying to show. So, that is the picture from the back of the napkin. So, what I do is I would draw out that in pencil first on the A5 sheet of paper. I would then um, decide um, on, the, uh, on, on the outline. And then in the picture there was always, did you notice the little red tulips? Yeah, okay, so in the, in the video, the red tulip is the world sign of Parkinson's disease. A red tulip. Okay. Can I believe that? Yeah. Okay. So the red tulip is the sign of Parkinson's disease. And when you do it in pencil and pen, the difficulty is that sometimes if you make a mistake, you can't change it. Okay. So there's a mistake there. Okay. So that should not be in a little A, but it is. But it doesn't really matter because nobody really notices until I point it out. But that's how that's how the pictures come to come to life, and it's amazing how with letters, simple letters, if you put arms and legs on them, they can become little characters, and they can tell a story. So it's um, and that would take about something like that would take about an hour to do. It's not it's not it's not, it's not overly long, um, but if you're doing a lot of them, then it, it can be. Um, so that's a more simplified picture from the video. So obviously it's London, yeah. Um, doesn't need to be too detailed. Everybody looks at that and goes, "There's a family of four here in London, yeah." And it can, it can, it can, it can, uh, it can tell a story quite, quite, quite easily. And um, then what I did was I, um, I just have a bog standard uh, scanner, printer, photocopier, all in one. So I then uh, scan the picture in. Uh, I then um, I open it up on my, on the computer. I cropped it, and then and now what I do is a, is a noir. So you can noir it on your Apple Mac, which makes the black lines even darker. Um, and that's really how 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 the pictures come together. So this was back in sort of October time last not last year, 2018, and um, every, every three years there's a World Parkinson's Congress. Uh, the first one was I think in uh, Washington, there was one in Oregon. Uh, one in June last year was in Kyoto, Kyoto, Kyoto in Japan, and then the one in 2022 is in Barcelona in Spain, so it's a bit, it's a bit closer to home. So, um, it came to my attention that there was, there was a competition, so um, the World Parkinson's Congress is interesting because the only conference I know of where patients and, and medics join together, so it's for everybody. So, um, you know, it's not just for doctors, healthcare professionals, it's for patients with Parkinson's, it's for carers with Parkinson's, it's for uh, physicians who treat Parkinson's. And, um, the closing date for this video competition was the 7th of January last year and I thought to myself, do you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to draw uh, the story of the diagnosis through my daughter's eyes and I'm going to enter this competition. So that's, so that's what we did. So um, we, 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 we entered it and it was open to, you can enter a video if you were a, a physician, a care, a patient with Parkinson's or uh, a, a, somebody doing research. There's four different. There's four different categories. So, how did I put it all together then? Well, I thought to myself, whenever you're drawing the story, of the diagnosis, I thought to myself, will I tell it through this, the eyes of a 44-year-old me? Should I tell the story through my eyes? And then I thought, mm, maybe. And then I thought, will I tell the story through my wife's eyes? But she, 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 she didn't agree to that. So uh, I'm still, uh, this is the one I really want to make, the, the, the story through my wife's eyes. 
And then my two kids at that stage were 9 and 13. And my son hadn't really said very much about a diagnosis. But my daughter was quite vocal and quite asking a lot, a lot, a lot of questions. So I thought I would do this through her, through her eyes. So, whenever you embark on something like that, you think to yourself, well, how many drawings do you need for a three minute video? Three, three and a half minute video, because that, that was the time frame, you're allowed three and a half minutes. And actually, when you count through that video, which is three and a half minutes, it's 26 drawings on 52 slides. It took four months to do. And that was pretty much drawn, you know, uh, four months is what, 12 weeks? So it was two, two drawings a week. So uh, Thursday night the swimming pool, Friday night the swimming pool. And, uh, and, and that's, that's how much it took. So it's not quick, it wasn't quick. It's not a quick thing to do. Um, so just bear that in mind if you're, if you're designing something and you put an order into it, um, it can take, it can take uh, longer than you think. So sound and timing is really, really important. And the music in that, I don't know what it is about that little video, but the music just gets you. And it just gets you at the right point. You know, it slows down and then it speeds up and then it slows down and then it speeds up. And it's really quite poignant. Um, and if you, if you play it with different music, which I have, it just doesn't have, it doesn't seem to have the same effect. So the music is really, really important. What music you pick is really important, as is the timing, because I was making this and I was thinking, so I'd send a few people, so I send a few people Parkinson's and said, do you have enough time to read the slides compared to somebody who can read the slides you know, a, a normally? And they were like, yes, yes you can. So whenever you show to people, some people go, oh, those slides are, it's too long to, to, to um, it's too much time for each slide. And then some people go, those slides are too short. So you can never quite get it right, but I think, I think we've got the balance. Potency just about right. Um, so, what I did then was I, I basically just made it on iMovie. Um, the interesting thing about iMovie is whenever you um, try to uh, pull the pictures in, they come, they come up black. So, what I had to do was screenshot every one, screenshot every picture, and then pull, pull, pull them into photos and then pull them in down. So at the start, it, it, I couldn't work out how to do it. And then one day, I, I, I worked out how to do it. And then it's, it's just a matter of, of obviously pulling in the slides, uh, the, the drawings, and then pulling in the text. So we just decided to do in black and white because the drawings were black and white. That's what, that's what we decided. But if you look along the bottom, you can see there's 2.8, 2.6, 5, 4, 3.8, 3.9, 5.3, 5.2. So every slide was different. Every 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 slide was different. And you find yourself you find yourself playing it and replaying it, and um, cutting down by 0.2 of a second. Is that just too long? It, it can get a bit. You can get really engrossed in it, and then you have to just go right. That's it. Stop now. That's it. Done. It's done. It's done. So uh, that's that's how we uh, that's how, how how it all came together. So. Yeah. Is iMovie free then? iMovie, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it on the yeah. iPad or? It's on the iPad, yeah. Yeah. You can just get on your iPad, yeah. On your phone. You can, you, can make, you can make it on your phone, whatever. And then, obviously, I, I never really put anything on YouTube before. This was the first thing I ever put on YouTube. So, um, you just put in, you know, uh, the title um, and then just a, a, bit, a, bit, a bit about it. So, she, she didn't actually write that. I wrote it. But it was based on things that she had, she had said over, over three years, uh, uh, as she learned, uh, as she learned to deal with the, deal with the diagnosis. So, um, yeah. So yeah, the red tulips. Um, as I said, the red tulips are the worldwide symbol of Parkinson's disease. Um, I went in and did this talk, not this talk, but showed the video to her school class last year. Now, if you think you're nervous standing up in front of a crowd in, in Nottingham in a medical education course, try try standing up and giving a talk like this in front of eight-year-olds who watched the video, counted the number of tulips in the video, and then questions for an hour and a half. Literally, an hour and a half of questions. 
question, question, question. And they were really, really good questions. Like it was unbelievable. So that was that was the best uh, the best invitation we had. So but interestingly in that the, the if you watch the video again, the the at the as as we move through the diagnosis, did anybody notice anything about the children? You didn't notice. You didn't notice. Okay. So the bud the bud slowly develops. So there's a plant and the bud the plant starts to grow. The bud starts to appear, a little bit of red, and then it comes up a bit more. It's outside neurology outpatients and in the clinic they blew. Nobody noticed that? Okay. So that's that's the that's the secret uh, the secret uh, thing about the video. That, uh, some people notice and some people don't. So you produce something like this and you think, well what what's the impact? What what impact does it have? So um so we um we decided to put it out on, on social media. So I, I I have a social media account, Twitter. I don't do Facebook or uh, Instagram or anything like that, I just do Twitter. So this this went out and somebody then it went out the day before her her ninth birthday. And uh, this is what somebody somebody put, which I think um, I think really captures what it was what it was trying to achieve. I, I don't even know who that person is. And um, they live in America. Uh, but that's what they that's what they came back. And uh, I thought, yeah, well that, that sums up that, that sums it up. Um, so then what happened was it got shortlisted. It got shortlisted for the conference. So out of the hundred videos that went through, the best thing about having your name as an A is that it appears in the top left hand corner. So, you know, um, right up right on the top left hand corner, which is great. So you I didn't really know about all these different people, but um, there was a man called Tom Isaacs. Okay, so Tom Isaacs uh, was diagnosed with Parkinson's about 20 years ago, and he set up a foundation called the Cure Parkinson's Trust. And he he probably is the most inspirational person in the Parkinson's community, and he sadly died about three years ago. So. There was a lot of this was the first conference since his death, so there was an awful lot of videos, um, you know, as a tribute to as a tribute to him. Um, Matt Eagles is forty seven. He was diagnosed with Parkinson's when he was seven. He had the first MRI scan in the UK. The first MRI scan that was ever done in the UK was done on him. Yeah, uh, and he's been living with Parkinson's for forty years. This lady is from Peru. She's a missionary. She's an Australian, a missionary from Peru. She taught herself how to do a handstand with Parkinson's. And that is pretty impressive. I can't do a handstand. I've watched her video many times. And I message her and go, I still can't do this. <laughs> so um, it's really, really quite, quite, uh, quite inspirational. So there was 12, there was 12 videos that, um, that, got, uh, that got put through. And then there was a, the, the, they decided who the winner was. And then there was a People's Choice Award. So we thought to ourselves, thought to myself, um, should, should we go to Japan or not? Okay, so um, so we, we did. So we went in June, myself and my wife. It was a long way to go for six days, but I thought, you know what? Never going to have the chance to go to Japan again. So we did. So we went to Kyoto. And um, on the... Um, on the Thursday, there was this massive, massive um, conference hall, and it was there. Now, the, the difficulty I had was that we decided to go sightseeing that morning and missed it. So, so we didn't actually get to see it on the, on the, on the big screen, but, um, but everybody else did. And uh, it, it, was, it, was, uh, it, was, it was, it was, well, they say it was a really special moment, but but we we uh, we missed it. But that wasn't the, that wasn't the, the point. But uh, but yeah, it was uh, it was up there. So that was that was it. So then what happened after Japan? So we didn't win the People's Choice Award, and we didn't win the um, we didn't win the, the judging award. So the the tribute to Tom Isaacs uh, won it won. But then something really amazing happened. So I landed back in the UK, kept getting all these messages. 
on Twitter, on email, and saying, can I translate this for you into different languages? From all around the world. So, um, this went on for about three months, from sort of September, October, November time. And it's now translated into 17 different languages. Um, and the most popular of those actually is in Iceland, believe it or not. Yeah, it's, it's quite big in Iceland. <laughs> so um, it's, uh, it's amazing sort of what people did. So um, the, the Icelandic Parkinson's Association put it out on their website. Um, we went to Copenhagen in uh, September because I was part of the UK Young Onset Parkinson's UK football team. Yes, it does exist. And we went to play in the Ray Kennedy Cup uh, in Copenhagen. We did, we did it, we did it in England. So we won the group and then we lost in the semi-finals 2-1. And we should never have lost, but it's a very sore point. But, um, but then the, the, the Danish uh, uh, Parkinson's Association put it onto their website and it's gone on to loads of different, gone on to loads of different websites. So, it, uh, it, it, was, it just totally blew me away that you, know, that you sit in your office one day with a napkin and you sketch out one picture and then you make a video and then you produce it and you put it into a competition. It goes to Japan, you land, you come back and suddenly there's all these people going, can, you, can we translate this for you? I, I didn't go out and say, can't. And just, you know, somebody came back and said, I'll do it into Spanish and then somebody else said, I'll do it into um, Chinese. It's, there is a Chinese version which is on a Chinese social media channel, but it's not on YouTube because it, it's blocked. So it's in China. It's in China as well. So, um, and then you get lots of messages saying, you know, it's been helpful for people. So, so that was good. So what happened next? Okay, so that was very exciting. Um, so then the EDPA, the European Parkinson's Disease Association, which is a, is a group uh, that works in England, but is, is European. They contacted me and they said, "Really like your drawings. Um, what, what, uh, uh, can we put, can we put this on, on, on a website?" So I was like, "Yes." And then I had a bit of a chat and I said, "Look, I've started to draw symptoms. Started to try to draw symptoms to get people to understand more about Parkinson's. So, how many, how many symptoms of Parkinson's disease are there? Anybody know? So it's over forty symptoms." Yes, there's a lot of symptoms. Motor symptoms, no motor symptoms. Very, un very misunderstood condition. But as I say to people, why would you know anything about it? Why would you know the depth about it? You only know the depth of it if, you've, if you're living with it or you know somebody with it. You ask me about multiple cirrhosis or you ask me about motor, motor neuron disease or you ask me about diabetes. I know bits and pieces, but I don't know the depth of it. I don't know the actual every day, nitty gritty of it. So, it's only when you're, you're engrossed in something that you really understand, you start to understand. So, they said, look, we, on our website we have this, um, we have all these symptoms. So these are, these are motor symptoms, so bradykinesia, so that is the not being able to move your wrist, your not, slowness of movement. Um, so that, that's what I first noticed. So standing in my house one night trying to do the, change the light bulb down, so it all got on, you know, could do this fine in this, this wrist and in this wrist just wouldn't move as quickly and I was like, that just doesn't move as quickly, what, what's going on? So um, that is the only symptom that everybody with Parkinson's disease has. Bradykinesia is the only one everybody has. So then the dyskinesia, dystonia, swallowing, eyes are affected, falls, freezing gait, restless legs, rigidity, tremor, wearing on and off. Um, and then you've got your normal motor symptoms, anxiety, apathy, autonomic dysfunction, bladder problems, Ball problems, compulsive impulsive behaviour, dementia, depression, fatigue, hallucination, excuse me, um, low blood pressure, my memory cognitive problems, loss of smell, pain, skin, sleep and stress. So there's, there's loads of loads of stuff to cover and they're like, Can you can you draw this? I thought, Tim, that's gonna take me away. It took me four months to do twenty six drawings for the um, for the video. So so I said yes. And this is what we did. So, we took a word, just a word, stiffness, symptom, and we, well I then tried to draw it. We tried to draw the scene. What, how, can I, how can I portray what stiffness is like? Yeah? So, got the, got the, um, 
got the cartoon, and then put a strap line underneath. So I think you need the three. You need the word, you need the drawing, and you need the strap line, because it brings it all together. Okay, so if I say to you, oil, oz, forget oz, I need some oil. You get, you, you start to understand what that might be like. Yeah. So again, putting arms and legs and characters, and then what I realised was if you tilt them a little bit, 10 degrees, left to the right, they suddenly look as if they're moving. So, um, it's, um, it's um, So, then you go on to start to develop what a really good picture looks like. And what a really good picture looks like is the contrast between the black and the white. Okay, so, and how can you, how can you, how can you portray facial masking? So some days, I will look stone dead. I'll just look like this. Now, when you're sitting in a consultant meeting in the less room for me with your other consultant colleagues, every, when you look right, everybody looks, looks like that. They all look as if they've got facial masking. So I blend in quite well. <laughs> so, but it's really, um, it's really trying to portray that your emotions are hidden. So, so people with Parkinson's, they look as if they're not interested, but they actually are. They are interested, just sometimes they can't show. So that that's what that's what that that was trying to show. And then there's a concept of sort of wearing off. So there is no cure. Medication just masks the symptoms. And you know there are times where you'll wear off. So my medication lasts for about four hours. Uh, between sort of half ten and half eleven, I'll wear off. Between. Uh, um, half twelve, half one, and then by sort of half four, half five, in between medications. So I, I, I took my dose later this morning because I knew I was coming here today, so hopefully it hopefully won't be wearing off. But it is, it is, it is a, it's the invisible symptoms that, that, that I think sometimes cause more difficulty than the ones that, that are seen. So that was just a way to try to portray what wearing off looks like. So, I send them all these pictures and then what they've done is they have embedded them into their educational um, document about bradykinesian diagnosis and treatment. So when you click on their website and click bradykinesia, you see this first, which sort of tries to give you the impression of what it's like, slowness of movement. So it's like trying to walk through treacle, it's like running a race with a with a heavy ball on your on your ankles. And um, you know they're ten minutes in and they haven't really moved very far. So, so that's um, so that's what they've done with all those drawings. Um, and then the other great thing about it is that you can actually present posters uh, with with uh, with the drawings. So, this was one. They they have a conference in uh, in not in well it's in the East Midlands every year. It's an emergency medicine conference called uh, EM2C. So and they said they actually came to me and said, "Can you produce two posters that will educate about Parkinson's?" Well, um, you are. Uh, it was at the same time as in Japan, so it was the first time I was at two conferences at the same time without actually without actually being there. So this was just saying, "Can you animate to educate two people every year in the UK told the Parkinson's? Um, can you animate to educate?" So that really just shows you. The, uh, that shows you the, the motor, the motor, the motor symptoms, um, and then we've got uh, we've got the non-motor symptoms. So again, um, various various ways of of portraying it. Um, so that's basically what what what. Where was that sort of this time last year? Um, the the EDPA stuff was just starting to just starting to happen. Obviously, Japan happened, and then so did uh, so did you know putting those posters up in the conference. So so how do you build momentum? So I think when you get a diagnosis like that, you sort of think to yourself, well, what what can you do? So what can you do to try to um, raise awareness, to advocate, to try to um, use your medical education background and use your um, medical training and have them living with the condition to actually try to change something 
or do something. So, um, so what we did then was arts and heritage in our trust. So there's a there's an arts and heritage um, society, um, and then uh, there's also the art art Attenborough Art Centre that has links to the University of Leicester Medical School. And I said um, they, they arts and heritage in Leicester put up displays um, for art around the hospital. So I thought, well. I've got 32 drawings here that are, are just sitting in a sketchbook. Um, do you want to use them? So they said yes. So what we did in, uh, in November was that they agreed to put up a, put up a display, an art exhibition in the Trust. So it's up, still up. went up in November, December, January, February. So we up four months now. Now, if you ever if you ever wonder what estates do in your trust, yeah, this is what they do. They put up a display that is so straight. When you look at it, you go, how on earth did you do that? Like, look how straight that is. It's so straight. It's really good. So what we did was we, um, we sourced the frames. Okay. So you want to, you want to do this not too expensive because you want to, you want to, you want to do obviously. Uh, get done. So the range, okay, the range, the shop, the range, do these frames for five forty nine. That's it. That's all it is. So you can get thirty two frames at five fifty. So that's about one hundred and eighty quid. You buy the brackets down the screw fix for about twenty, and it costs about twenty pounds to print them out. So you get the whole display for three hundred and twenty pounds. It's not. It's not. It's not expensive today. And um, every so often. It's just around the corner from the emergency department. So I, I sort of will juke up, stick my head around the corner, see if anybody's looking at it. And if they are, I'll just go and have a little chat. And uh, it's very interesting. But uh, originally, it was supposed to be put up alphabetically. It's supposed to be A to Z. I went up on the Thursday and I put them all up totally random. I thought, I can't, I can't say anything. I can't say it. Oh, these are all wrong. These were so straight. So I, um, I just left them. But actually, it worked out quite well because, you know, you don't know what's coming next. So that was that. Was, uh, so that was uh, that was um, that was uh, the opening. So that's Sally. She's Arts and Heritage, and then you know that's a, that's the trust. Uh, one of the trust co-chairmen. So that's the director of our operations. So I've never been to a meeting before where ever these people turned up. So it was really quite impressive. You can see I was a bit off there. I was a bit facially masked because it was half five at night and my meds weren't working that well. So, um, but what's really interesting about this is we have, we have three Parkinson's nurses in Leicester and two of them have left. And there was really, they weren't going to fund them. You know, they were like, we're, we're not going to fund them. Something like this. They advertised two posts last, last week. So it does have an impact. It does have an impact. It basically raises the profile, and it, it just puts you know it just puts that question in the in the people's minds about you know is this worth investing? In? Is this worth investing? In? So it's not just about drawing. And then in the medical school uh, in Arts and uh, the, the Attenborough Centre last two weeks ago, um, I met the lady about about just before Christmas, and it's a massive wall in the medical school when you walk in in the Leicester Medical School. And she said, we're going to blow these up to A3. I was like, okay. Again, if you go to the range, the A3 frame is only 9.49. That's it. So you can frame all those for less than 300 quid. So again, but they did put them up alphabetically. They put them all up alphabetically. So it, uh, it's, uh, it's amazing what's happened. There, there it is. So that's the size of it. So, it really is there for um, you know all the students that walk in the medical school, the first years, second years, third years, fourth years, fifth years, just to just to um, to show them what, what Parkinson's disease is like. When it was being put up, there was a little thing over here that said Parkinson's betrayed. So before it went up, I I, I sat down with the lady who who organised it, and we just we just sat in the atrium for an hour and a half, just watching them go up. And um, 
If some medical students sitting beside they were first year, I said, you, you medical students, they went in. I mean, what year are you in? And they went first year. I was like, have a look at these pictures and tell me what you think the diagnosis is. So I sort of looked, and then they went, um, is it alcohol? I think no. And then somebody went, uh, I'm on my lunch. I was like, right. And then somebody else went, um, is it uh, just a hypochondria? I was like, no, no, no. So, um, so again, just just using the pictures, and then we, we gave them the Bradley Kinesia one, and then they asked a few more questions, and then they're like, oh, is it Parkinson's? Okay, good. So, um, so yeah, it's there, it's there just in the space for people to look at and to, and to educate. So, then the question is, this is the big question, traditional versus digital. Okay, so this has been my little, little battle this year. So, traditional works, A5 bit of paper, black and white pen, pencil, rubber, yeah, why change? Who would change? Who would, who would, if it works, why would you change? Or not? Depends what you're doing. Okay, so, got this for Christmas. Well, I actually got it from birthday uh, in November. And um, this, is, this isn't a drawing, this is an actual badge. So, when I joined, you joined Parkinson's UK, Team Parkinson. You know, so they sent me this little badge that, that goes, it's just little pin bands. So it sat, it, sat in my, um, it sat in my drawer at home for about three months. Didn't do anything. And then there was one morning, I don't know why, but I picked it up, put it on the dining room table, and then got a torch. It was about half five in the morning. Shone, shone a torch on it, and all started to reflect, and then took a photograph. And I thought, what does that look like? What does it look like? Brain. A what? A brain. Yeah, it's, it looks like a brain, but what is... Do you see anything else in it? Is, is he not sort of got his eyes closed and he's sort of smiling at you? Eyes closed, eyebrows, eyes, mouth? Maybe? Okay. So, I thought to myself, how can I use this to help patients? Because this is what it's about. It's about helping patients. So I put it on my lanyard. Yeah? How often do patients with Parkinson's in hospital get their medication on time? Roughly. Percentage wise. Any idea? About 60%. 60% of the time. That's it. Last year, there was an extra 20 and a half thousand extra nights in hospital because people with Parkinson didn't get their medication in time. So you don't get your medication in time, you're stiffer, you can't move, physios come to see you the next day, you can't be rehabbed, you end up in you end up going to rest by you end up going to nursing home to be rehabbed. You don't get rehabbed, you end up going hoisted and you get home and the care burden in, in the system is massive. So this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to raise awareness that everybody with Parkinson's needs a medication time in the NHS. And what we did, what I've done, is I took the badge and I drew arms and legs on them. Okay. So, so this is basal ganglion. This is Cynthia Nuclear. Okay. And they have started to try to change things. Um, no, let me see if I can get this video. an app called Procreate, okay, using an iPad, and what it does is you can pull in colour so quick, okay, they are so quick to draw, 
It's not, it's not hard to do. You pull the colour in. The difficulty with black and white drawings is when you had a really black background, you had to do it over and over again in pen, took ages. And then when you know it, and it was still, it still wasn't right, and you had to go over it again, and you had to scan it again. This is brilliant. This, this gets it done so quick. So we tweeted that out in October, and we said to all NHS staff, what's this? Wear, wear the blue green badge on your NHS lanyard to raise awareness of people with Parkinson's in hospital. And um, they've told us that before that, they used to get one application a month from professionals in the NHS. And since October, they've had about 400. There's now a three week delay in getting a badge because it's they're so behind with people just 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 getting the badges. So so that that's been really really good. Um, the other thing you can do with this is you can just have a bit of fun. Okay, so when Ozzy Osbourne gets diagnosed with Parkinson's, what you can do is you can take a little blue bean bed, stick a guitar on, give him some long hair, and add him his glasses. Yeah. So um, so that's. That's, that's good. The other thing you can do then with colour is that you can, you can, you can try to educate three different ways. So, I I was flying home on New Year's Eve, and my daughter was sitting beside me on the plane, and we had a, there was a there was a Lego, um, there was a Lego man on a on a on, on the page, and I was sitting there going, do you know what? He he could be used to educate about Parkinson's because, actually. You know, when you look at him, he, he might have a he might have face a mask because he, he doesn't actually ever smile. Um, he doesn't talk, so his voice might be soft. He's got a reduced arm string because to move it, you really have to yank it. Um, he, they can be quite stiff, can't they, when they when they move? Um, if you stick him down under another block, he he freeze. He can't move. Um, and then people in the Parkinson's community talk about Lego hands, so that that gave me the idea. Go to pick something up, your hands just feel like Lego. You know, you can't grip or be shaking. Um, so, so, so I actually asked Lego. I tweeted them and said, "Can I, can I use your Lego to educate about Parkinson's?" And then I found an article online that in America they have for dementia and for Parkinson's they, they, they have Lego cafes. So patients come and they just build Lego, and um, you know they they uh, it, it helps to find dexterity. So the other thing you need to remember when you're educating is that this is a man, okay? And then people go to you and go, well, you can't just do a man. You have to do a, 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 a woman as well. You have to do a female. So, so we did. So I was a bit, I was a bit nervous about doing the, the female because I wasn't, I wasn't quite sure um, how to how to dress her. But um, I think, I think I got, it. I think we got, it, got it right. So I sent that to a, 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 a friend of mine who's a, who's a nurse in Sheffield who's got Parkinson's and I said, what do you think? And she's like, fine. She goes, but can, can you put some lipstick? Can you have them holding lipstick? Because that's what they really struggle with, getting a lipstick on. So she goes, put, put, put the lipstick in and uh, we'll see. So again, um, so people have, have messaged me and said, can we use this? So we, We've set up a crowdfunding page to try to um, raise funds to get them the art. We're trying to get into ten trust, ten medical schools this year, and um, anybody who's asked to use that would just say, "Can you, can you donate in the crowdfunding page?" And people, people have because they're going into schools and they're using this to educate children about Parkinson's disease. A Lego man, like you wouldn't, you wouldn't even think that it's possible. Um, and then there's other things you can do. So you can take a brain and you can. You can visual. You can make a visual. Um, you know, it says what it is. Again, that's very easy to pull in. Um, but then, then the the question is, can can you recreate? Can you recreate it? So, I um, when I whenever I came back from Japan, my son said, um, Dad, can you make a video about me? Because uh, you know, you know, me and one of my banana. So I was like. Well, let's sit down and have a chat. So we sat down and had a chat, and I said, right, we'll, we'll put this. I would like to do this. I would like to do that. So, so then I thought, well, it's like making a trailer. It's like making a, it's like making a film, and then the first one, you get it just right, and then and then the, the sequel just doesn't quite live up to you know live up to the expectation. But it wasn't like that. It wasn't a sequel. 
as two separate entities. So, uh, so, so we did. So, um, I'll show you that in a minute. But whenever I, I said I was doing that, the Cure Parkinson's Trust worked with the Van Allen Institute in America, uh, where a lot of uh, a lot of uh, Parkinson's research is done, and they have a they have um, two research meetings a year. This one was in August. It brings together thought hundreds of scientists and clinicians with people with Parkinson's to explore, explore the latest research. So it was on genetics in August, and they contacted me and they said, "Can we open?" The conference with this video, um, so I said yes. So uh, this is this is how the this is how the Van Andel, Van Andel Institute was uh, was open. Now I might need to uh, do the same. Thing. We tried to make that uh, a bit more, obviously the language in it was a bit more mature. Um, we, tr we tried to bring in a bit more humour into it if you can. And uh, you know, I think, I think it works, I think it works quite well. Um, so that's basically a, a rundown of the past, the past sort of, well, 18 months since I started the draw. It's been quite, been quite, quite interesting. Quite an interesting journey. And um, so, what what's the plan for 2020? Um, so, um, I wonder if this play. Actually. I'm not sure I did this a video. Um, I'll go back. Um, so, 
I've discovered how to make them move, to make pictures move. Uh, in the past, then in the past couple of weeks, we went up to Manchester last last week to um, to test an app. So again, technology and, and, and it was really in research. So there's a lady in Scotland, believe it or not, called Joy Mill, who can smell Parkinson's. Has anybody heard about this? Yeah, she can smell Parkinson's. Okay, she's from Scotland. Her husband's a consumptionist, and he had Parkinson's for 32 years, and she noticed a smell about 10 years before he was diagnosed. So she's been working with the University of Manchester in the Mass Spectrometry Lab to identify what the smell is. So it's basically sebum. So people with Parkinson's produce sebum, the ears, tops their shoulders, and it gives off a distinct smell that not everybody can smell, some people can. So, um, and they've identified what the three molecules are. So there's three molecules on a mass spectrometer that identify Parkinson's. And there's one that is, is a lot less than Parkinson's. So they're gonna bring out a big study now, um, nationally, in the next year, to take skin swabs of people's backs to, to get, get data to see um, what, what the sensitivity and specificity is. Um, so I went up last week and then when I came home I just draw them a picture so um, it was just basically trying to trying to convey that this is what they're doing. You see the massive extraordinary specs at six and seven where the, where the, where the PD is. Um, so that that will be interesting because I think if people, although there's nothing, there's no medication that slows down progression, I think if, if I knew when I was 25 that I was going to get Parkinson's or I had it, then it, the one thing that may slow progression is exercise. So two and a half hours of exercise a week, they think slows progression. So that's why I exercise two and a half hours a week. And uh, but if I knew that when I was 25, I would have been exercising two and a half hours a week. Uh, and then hopefully there'll be a, a, a disease slowing medication. So if people can identify earlier exercise and disease modifying drug, then the symptoms won't necessarily. Uh, progresses long, and then the other thing that I've managed to learn how to do is um, is is is, uh, is 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 make a move. Okay, so Basil Basil will now can now move. Um, again, that's just done on an iPad. It's just copy and pasted on about four different layers, and then you just make one each one disappear, and then you you put that into uh, iMovie. And then there's an app called, um, I'll, I'll get the name of it, but it, you can slow it right down. So you can slow it right down, you can speed it right up. So on iMovie, you can um, increase your speed to double. Uh, on, on this app, you can increase your speed like five times more. So you can make him go even, go even faster. So the question I'll leave you with is, can you animate to educate? And I think that you can. Thanks very much.